I'd like to recognize Dandrin Clark uh, from the Caribbean Life newspaper. And also Pat Lansford from the Guyana Tri-State. Pat. And I would like to now introduce to you the Foreign Affairs and International Development Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Development, Utah. I like the name Utah, you know why? He knows, but I'll share it with you. His dad, who's now 81 years old, we have been friends for a long time. Uh, we did a lot of poetry together on Swan. Minister, please come. Thank you very much for that introduction. His Excellency the President, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, Foreign Secretary, Ambassadors, Religious Leaders, Member of Parliament, and more importantly, the wonderful group of individuals who have taken time off to be here this evening with us to share, to dialogue, and to build strong bonds of friendship. Welcome. Please give yourselves a round of applause. When President Ali speaks about development, he's speaking to Guyana and the diaspora. And he's focusing on a balanced development. Not just the infrastructural works that you will see, or the tangible things that you will see. But the main emphasis is on social development and enhancement. So when he speaks about transformation and transforming lives, everything that we do in terms of our policies and our strategies is centered around the individual, the citizen. It's important for us because our sovereignty depends heavily on our value system and how strong we are as a people. So the One Guy Initiative is designed to create nationhood, integration, and a strong cultural bond that will assist Guyana in being that great country that we always dreamed of. That vision is anchored in a value system that will drive the economy, because without people, and without a strong value system, we would not get the results that we're looking for. And we've seen many examples around the world. So when you look at the representation that President Ali is providing the people of Guyana and for you in the diaspora, it is coming from a sense of strong conviction and belief in the people, the Guyanese people, who we know have the strength and the commitment to service. So that partnership is built on the representation that President Ali and his cabinet and the government is giving to the people and the relationship that we get out of that. So when we look at, when we look at the development of Guyana, it means that we have to have leadership at all of every level. So at the political level, we have policies that are inclusive, that are based on equity or fairness. And President Ali speaks about that a lot. Fairness, making sure that each and every Guyanese citizen get what they deserve. So our mandate is to ensure that we can create prosperity. Our interaction with the religious Community is important as well because religion provides strong tenets for values which we believe are important. So in Guyana, we have the same religious groups as we have in diaspora because when you move, you move with your faith and we depend on that connection. There's a connection there as well. And President Ali, as a man of faith, depends heavily on the religious community. You hear him speaking about, may God bless Guyana, may God bless us all. He is strong in his belief, he's a man of faith, of empathy, 
and he understands that focusing on building that strong cultural connection through religion and the respect for religion and tolerance is important in bringing us together as one people and one nation. So for us as politicians or representatives as we would like to call ourselves and servants, we want to work with the religious community to ensure that we can have leadership at every level within the society because we believe it, it forms strong roots, it creates a strong value system and it helps us because we have a rules-based system that we cherish. The Constitution, which provides the framework in how we do business. So we have to have a strong value system as representatives and the people as well. So that is the partnership that we have to build because we have to respect the Constitution so as the population so that we can have that strong connection in respecting the Constitution, the rule of law, we providing good governance and stability and predictability for a better future for all. So for us in the government and through the leadership of President Ali, we will continue to work with religious groups, not only in Ghana, but in the diaspora, because we see it as central and important in ensuring that we keep a strong value system that will help us to remain on track and on course so that we can realize the dreams that we have set as a people and as a nation. Once again, I thank you very much for being here. I'm happy to be here to, to be part of this occasion as well. Let us continue to work together in partnership. And let us continue to keep our faith strong, continue to pray for Guyana, continue to pray for the president, and continue to be strong in your faith. So thank you very much and God bless. Minister of Foreign Affairs, Utah, put your hands together. And also put your hands together for the rest of the, the folks on the desk. Uh, the Minister, the Ambassador, President, I'm told that there are a lot of people outside and people standing and there are just a few seats in the front. So the few who can come can grab the seat before the keynote speaker comes to give us his remarks. If you can kindly come, there are a few seats to the front and so on. And whilst you're coming, uh, there are a few seats. I think there's one there and uh, there maybe two or two there, you know. And oh, there, there are other seats in the middle here. So you can come in. I'm told people are outside and people are standing there. And if you want to come close and see the president and hear what he has to say, this is the right time to do so. Anyone from Lenora? Yeah. Leg one. Anyone from Guyana here? The diaspora is representing Guyana, man. I, I, I'm so happy. Put your hands together. <laughs> Guyana is blessed. Yes. Guyana is blessed. Yes. To have so much resources to have all my people. And to have a president at this time who endeavors to connect to our communities. I have See him moving around to the various communities, trying his best to connect and to stop the divide and to make it a one Guyana. It's a great phrase, Mr. President, a one Guyana phrase. I, I know a few years ago also, that phrase was also written of by Dan Paul Narine and Terence Blackman, both of them doctors here in the diaspora. So it's a great thing. Here we can come as one, one people, one nation, one destiny, one Guyana. Put your hands together for one Guyana. I was warned not to say that. You know, um, but it's a great feeling to know we can be one. God wants us to be one. I, I am a man of faith, so I, I, I like unity. I love, like love, loving each other. I, I, you know, that's what I like. But we have a president. He, in 2006, 
I was given a, a, a paper with a long bio, and I said, too long for me to read, boy. I was just going to talk. President, 2006, he joined the National Assembly, and then he became the Minister of uh, Housing and Water, I'm thinking. And then subsequently in 2020, I think August 6th, he became the president of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. That, that's a, a good thing. Put your hands yeah. together. Clap to the people on land can hear you. And let the people in Guyana know what the diaspora is talking about. We have a president I know is scared. He's passionate about the theme on Guyana. He's passionate about Guyana and Guyanese. And he decided to stop here to talk with us as he came to the United Nations. That's the thing. So without further ado, I'd like you to stand and put your hands together for Dr. Mohammed Thank you very much, very kindly. Thank you, please. Thank you. You're very kind, very, very kind. Thank you so much. My dear respected elders, respected leaders of the religious community, leaders of community, respected Guyanese, our men and women in uniform who serve greatly across the globe. <laughs> Children, I thank you graciously for your very warm welcome. Today, as I address you, I've just completed a similar address in Orlando, and I can say, maybe one of the features of going live is that I say refer to that Orlando speech and let's move on. <laughs> but I'm very fortunate to be born in a country in which we present to the world six different dimensions of humanity bonded together in a singular fuse called Guyanese, a community we are all part of. One of the greatest gifts I've received is to be born in a country that has the greatest possibility to be a leader in the globe on every single challenge that the world faces today. You see, challenges and opportunities go hand in hand. There can never be an opportunity if there is not a challenge. And it, an opportunity cannot be realized if we don't challenge ourselves to make use of the opportunity. I know this afternoon many of us as Guyanese are not as happy as we should be because of the performance of the warriors. Yeah. I saw, I just saw a meme saying the warriors are making all of us warriors. <laughs> Notwithstanding that, let us give them a round of applause and lift their spirit. Because one of the greatest things we can do in life is to lift the spirits of those who are weak and to lift the spirits of those who are faced with the greatest challenge. And one of the greatest things leaders can do is understand that they have a responsibility to lift the spirit of every single person that they are gifted to lead. And as Guyana's chief servant, I take this responsibility very seriously. My dear brother and friend who is chairing our program made two statements. 
God wants us to be one. I just want to add to that statement that God don't really want us to be one. God created us to be one. You were created as part of a singular humanity. You were not created black, white, brown, pink, or orange. We were created as part of the family of humanity. We decided that we are going to define ourselves differently in the family of humanity. All we need to do is to get back to the fundamental aspect as to why we were created and how we were created and then we'll understand the principal purpose of life as being in one whole humanity. And then, one Diana phrase. If we conceptualize the concept of one Diana as a phrase, will not achieve what one Guyana is looking to achieve. Because one Guyana is not a phrase, a slogan, or pieces of words. One Guyana requires action, commitment. It requires a fulfillment of every single one of us joining collectively to pushing one thing forward, Guyana. I am not asking anyone to be PPP, APNU, whatever, PNC. All I'm asking for in the one Guyana construct is for all of us to put Guyana first and do what is right in positioning Guyana first. And the rest will take care of itself. The rest will take care of itself. If we all love this country so dearly, and we all believe in the country so dearly, and we all want to see the country to be prosperous and unified, and the country to be on top and playing and its best part in the global community, then all we need to do is to make the individual effort in putting Guyana first, pushing Guyana first, advancing Guyana first. None of us can be bigger than the country. And once we are able to understand that our country should be first and our efforts should lead to positioning our country first, then we will rid ourselves of the selfish desires that bar us sometimes from putting our country first. And in putting our country first, it requires, like any system, rules, respect, laws, that we must all, we must all adhere to. The church cannot function without the foundation that is the embodiment of the value system that supports the church, same with the mosque and the temples. Similarly, a country must be built on a set of values and a system that promote peace, that promote dignity, that promote respect, that promote honor, and it is embodied in the constitution and the rule of law. We cannot claim to love the country and at the same time find it convenient, find it convenient not to abide by the rule of law or to respect constitutional rule or to respect and honor democracy and the rights of people and the will of the people. Those are principles and values we must never sacrifice and if together we all agree that these are principles and values that are paramount to anyone, any individual, any system, whether political system or political party. We are standing on these values that will support the future and the 
country we want to build, then we are 75% there because we are building a country based on values, systems, and principles that will allow the country and its people to blossom. So I want to start by addressing those issues. Now, what is it we want to achieve? I want to say that I wish to address a road today. We must understand where we are, where we want to be, and then define how is it we're going to get there. But in defining this, we must first of all, okay, we must first of all understand where we are. And we must question ourselves. What are the things where we are today that we are not happy with? What are the things where we are today that we must seek to change? And seek to change in relation to the outcome as to where we want to be. And then define the journey that will take us where we want to be. But in defining that journey, we have to be conscious that we are not operating in an environment by ourselves. We are part of a global community. And there are internal factors and external factors that will affect the way we grow and develop. So I want to take this little concept and as quickly as possible crystallize it in a way that will give you a flavor as to where we want to be and how we are going to get there. The conditions necessary to ensure we get there are issues of love, trust, commitment, involvement, respect, dignity, values, diversity, systems, patriotism, pride, and humility. Those are necessary things that would allow us to go on this journey. But those are things the government cannot control. Those are things all of us must control. Those are things that are personal to us individually. Because we cannot change the societal system if we don't change the system that is inside each of us. So if we are taught to hate, then we have to change that internally. Rethink and retrain ourselves so that we can love. If we are taught not to associate then we have to now re-strategize internally. So I'm saying this to say to all of us that we first must internalize everything that I'm going to say. And then ask ourselves the question, am I as an individual ready to make the changes that are necessary for us to accomplish what we want to accomplish? And if each of us make the positive change, then the community will change. If the community change, the region will change. If the region change, the country will change. So we have to understand that in driving this process, there must be empathy. You must feel something when your neighbor is hurt. You must feel something when your country is hurt. You must feel something 
when the rule of law is broken. And when you feel that, you must be able to speak up. You must be able to be part of a system that promote, that promote the values and virtues that will ensure those things do not occur. Responsibilities and opportunities also requires respect. And whilst my friend in the red hat is saying he is here for that, it requires you to have respect. If we cannot have respect for each other, we cannot listen to each other. And if we can't listen to each other, we can't solve any problem. Because if from the time you come, you come and you put up your hands and just want to speak over what we want to say, then we ain't headed nowhere. We ain't headed nowhere. I assure you of one thing. You need not to worry. This president will stand up and answer anything, anything, anyway. This So, so you see that's one of the first things. That's one of the first things we have to understand. The process of development is very simple. Communication is a very simple thing. It is us listening to each other and respecting each other. And you have nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing to worry about. We are here to listen also to ideas. None of us have the answers for everything. It is when we pool our collective effort. It is when we take collective responsibility that we are able to build a system that will support the development that I'm talking about. Now, let me address first of all how we build this future. And let me be clear on this. The future is not about the government alone. The future requires the parliamentary system, the political opposition, it requires civil society, it requires the diaspora, it requires women, young people, children, it requires every single facet of the society to be part of the development of the future. So let us not for a moment believe that this future belongs to the government. This future belongs to the people. When a government is elected, it is the end of the electoral process. But at the end of that electoral process, that government then has a responsibility to govern for all the people of the country. And when I was in Orlando, some people asked me, no, we wanted to see you such a long time, why two years after? And I said, first, we had a pandemic. You already forget that we went through a pandemic. But more importantly, I am spending time with the cabinet, walking every single community, listening to every single person, understanding the problems of every person's work. And I don't want to drive through the problem or fly through the problem. I'm walking the ground, listening to the people, 
feeling with the people, understanding with the people, so that we have a better sense as to what the people are faced with on the ground. Unless we have a personal connection and understanding with what people feel, we will not have a deep, a deep sense you know, empathy comes from a sense, a feeling. You have to be connected. I can, uh, you know, over here, many people would say, would call you and tell you, send something back home. But they don't know. Sometimes you wake up at four in the morning, you go through the worst snowstorm. You struggle. You know, I make, I make this point. When you left, you left because you wanted a better life. You wanted something better for your children, your future. You wanted to create a better condition for your family. But it came with sacrifices. It came with many sleepless nights. Similarly, now that opportunities are there in your homeland, we want you to be part of those opportunities. But you also need to use the same vigor that you left with. Use that same vigor you left with and go back with that vigor. Make the sacrifices. Make the commitment. Don't for a moment believe that you're going back to a system in which someone will reach out to you and say, Here, is there a basket of fruits taken? The world does not operate like that. You have to go and plant the tree and mold the tree and water the tree and the tree will blossom and you will get the fruits. You see, many people say to me, oh, we want to come to Ghana, we want to see you, we need to see you. And I said, but there is a system. You can go to go invest. No, we want to see you. If we don't understand that we need to build a system and trust the system, then we cannot solve the problem. That brings me to the second point. The institutional and political system. Let me be very clear. There is a lot of improvement that is needed in the system itself. The inefficiency that exists in the system must be fixed. But we are working on a plan that will fix it in a very, very rapid way. We are trying to remove the type of system that allows people to make decisions based on feeling. You know, the system must be developed in such a way that it works. And technology allows us to do that. And we're investing heavily in technology, in training, in human resource strengthening, capacity building to fix the system. And I can tell you, the system is improving. Now, you might give me an example, so let me give you before you give it to me. <laughs> that you're waiting a very long time to have your passports renewed. Yes. <laughs> that is one I hear a lot, even in Guyana. So let me explain to you. You know, one man said to me, he lives in Toronto, I can't come home. I can't get my passport. I said, but you live in Toronto, where's your Canadian passport? He said, I applied for that nine months ago and I'm still waiting. <laughs> and I said, and how long are you waiting for the Ghana passport? I said, he said, three weeks. <laughs> now let me explain something to you. We live in a global system. The supply chain crisis is real. The providers of our passport is a leading international company out of Canada. 
But because of supply chain issues, there is a tremendous shortage globally. And whilst there is this shortage, I don't know why, but the demand for Guyanese passport has increased by 500%. So unfortunately, we are hit with a perfect storm. We are hit with a supply chain crisis and a rapid increase in demand for the passport. And every day, the consulate, consulate office here would call the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. People cussing me. <laughs> but this is the reality. Since a year and a half ago, we ordered, I think, 80,000 passports. 80,000 passports. We have been continuously ordering. So I give you that one example. As we are in it, let me give you an next example. And you should know this best. The United States had to launch what we term a military mission for baby formula recently. Yeah. You see, sometimes we look at the news and we don't apply the news to what we are faced with. You know, when we look at the impact of COVID, all of us can point to someone who we knew that we lost. Very, very sad. Many of us even lost family members. But the impact of COVID is so profound that we can determine what the final end will be. Because the effects of long COVID is now being analyzed. But let me tell you, currently, what has been the direct impact of COVID? COVID sent 140 million people into extreme poverty around the world. This one pandemic, not only the debt, it sent 140 million people globally into extreme poverty. That is people living on less than a dollar US dollars one one dollar ninety cents per day. You don't hear these. This you don't hear this on the headline at CNN Big news. or Fox News. Let me just uh, make sure I'm politically correct here. Right? <laughs> you know why you don't hear it? And I'm going to speak about this at the UN. You don't hear it. Because those who are worst affected are the people in the developing world who the least attention is based on. That is why you don't hear it. You know, I use this example many times. There is a journalist who came very reputable international media outfit and said to me, you know, what are you guys going to do with all these resources and revenue from oil and gas? Right. You know, what this country is going to do with it? What are you going to do on climate change? And I was shocked. And I said, do you know that this country existed long before oil and gas? Do you know that this country has preserved a forest the size of England that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that has saved this world? And tell me, where were you asking the world if they're paying for this service the country was giving? Because if the world was paying for the service the country is giving, then our economy would be in the top 10 economy in the world, just by this one service. But the question is, what brought you to Ghana? Because we existed long before, we had this forest before, we were playing our part in climate change before, but, climate, but oil and gas brought you? It's the hypocrisy in the message. If it was never for oil and gas, they would have never came. They would have never featured Ghana. 
it would have been just another one in a number of developing countries finding our way and finding our path. But from the time you define your own path and there are revenues to take you down that path, then trust me, there is not enough specialists that you can count. Even we have more specialists than the trees we have in the forest now. <laughs> but this is the reality. So the second aspect is the political system that we must fix. We cannot go through elections after elections with uneasiness. The political system must be fixed that ensures political stability. You see, our country is developing at a very rapid pace and it's becoming very sophisticated. So the very sophisticated investors are coming in now. But with the sophisticated investors, trust me, the sophisticated criminals coming too. You guys know that better than I. You will have more exposure in terms of electronic crime. Because it is not only the good that are looking at opportunities. Right? The church will save the devil looking to win souls. <laughs> that is what makes their life very difficult. Because they have to keep the devil out and also win at the same time. <laughs> so we have to build a system. And when your political system is weak, when your political system cannot withstand the development of the country, or when, you, when there is porousness in your political system, it can be used. And we saw this. This is nothing new for us. This is what divided us in the forest place. This is what divided us in the forest place. The colonizers saw a weakness in the political system, a porous part of the political system, and they played it. They manipulated it. They divided us. They created a condition that has led to where we are. So if we don't understand that the political system must be strong to support the development agenda and to support the country, then we'll open ourselves up for those similar weaknesses in the future. That is why all of us must play a part in strengthening the system. Ensuring that the electoral laws, the constitution, democracy, the rule of law, that is all respected and it's, it works every single day. It can't work today and don't work tomorrow. It has to work every single day for it to be functional. People, systems, institutions. When we talk about crime, we have to talk about improvement in the Ghana police force that leads to transparency, holding people more accountable for their action. And we're using technology to help us with this. By the end of the first quarter next year, we're hoping that we'll be well on our way to have the entire course on the CCTV coverage. It's a massive investment, but a vital investment. Today, many of you will look at social media. Is that Angie? Oh my God. I work, she, we worked together when I was a technician at the Ministry of Finance. It's always good to see people you know. You know. Give you a shout out. So, the political, what was I saying? <laughs> You see, you see, you throw me off now. The CCTV system. So, our security system, our national security architecture is undergoing massive change. Massive change. And today, 
If you go on social media, you will see videos of every activity that occur. While crime is an issue, we have made steady improvement to the extent that we have perhaps one of the lowest rates right now in the region. But we amplify it. It's a small society. And we recognize it as a challenge. We are making the investments. We are investing in infrastructure, the equipment, giving the police officers the training. Many of them today are studying, they are doing degrees, diplomas. Because when you increase their self-worth, when you increase and improve their personal pride, then you're giving them additional motivation to be better at what they do. So, on the security front, you're making tremendous changes using technology and the best in class technology to drive the improvement in the security sector. You see, Guyana and the future of Guyana it's not about oil and gas. I want to make this very clear. Our future is not oil and gas. Our future will be built with revenues from oil and gas. Because we always had the natural assets to make a strong economy. What we never had was a revenue base to catalyze that asset. Today, for the first time, we have the revenue base that can catalyze that asset, that natural resource, bring the value added, and improve our economy in a multifaceted and diversified manner. For the first time, we have the clout, and it's important in the world. We have the clout. We have the network and the ability to influence. And in two years, what we have seen, as I speak to you today, six new hotels, internationally branded hotels, are under construction in our country. Many new ecologies, industrial and commercial zones, high-end real estate companies, well, if you have land in Guyana now, you know you're smiling all the way. <laughs> because whether you're on the West Coast, in Georgetown, the East Coast, East Bank, and now even in Barbies, the prices of land in the last two years would have increased by maybe between 300 to 2,000 percent in some cases. It's a reality. It's a reality. And many people are under the false impression that we have so much land in Guyana. What is the truth? The truth is that 80% of our population live on the narrowest strip of land on the coast. So we are already approaching maximum point. We are maximizing the land availability on the coast right now. Because between the Atlantic and the wetlands, we are almost there with land. Now we are seeing most of the development plans. We just had to bring the uh, Condominium Act. We had to pass a new Condominium Act. We have to change the height that buildings can go. So there will be physical change. There will be structural changes. Those of you who are coming back, or who have been going back for the last two years, every single day you are seeing changing before you. It's ex exciting times. Your young children, those of you who have young children, you should let them explore that now. Explore the opportunities in that. Because what we are doing is not responding to the current situation. The leadership we are providing is building an economy that is functional and appropriate for 2030 and beyond. Now, why do I say that? 
You see, this world we live in today will be a very, very different world in 2030. Every single thing that we are accustomed to will be drastically changed by 2030. And unless we're able to build the systems, the institutions, and the structure of the economy to function in a world 2030 and beyond, then we'll just be playing catching up. And not only building the economy and infrastructure, but building the human resources. Ensuring we have the appropriate human resource with the necessary skills that is applicable to a functional economy in 2030 and beyond. Very important. Because when we speak about sustainable and resilient development, sustainable and resilient development encompasses these aspects of these virtues. We want to position Diana as a leader in educational and health services. We are working now with Mount Sinai in the health sector. Our first order of business is to give the people in Diana the best possible access to primary health care. Primary health care is fundamental. Over the last two years, we have launched a program where we are giving annual vouchers to every single person who needs dialysis. And they can go to any facility that provides dialysis, whether private or public, to have that treatment. We've removed corporate taxes from healthcare and education completely. It is not tax at all. What that has allowed is for a lot of investment in private healthcare. Because we want the private healthcare services to focus on specialization and building a health hub in Guyana for the Caribbean and the diaspora because we are catering for a diaspora. There is a huge market in the health sector that goes to Asia, goes to India for treatment. Health tourism is a big thing. So we are opening up discussions right now with different stakeholders on building out the healthcare infrastructure. We, are right, we have already signed the contract for a very modern children and maternal hospital in Guyana. One that will give you all the services any children and maternal hospital offers anywhere in the world. We are building six new regional hospitals. One of the things that we are working on also is getting the right human resource. Doctors, nurses, technicians, lab technicians, to be part of what we want to build. It's a challenge because we have a small population. But with the growth in the whole welfare package that includes salaries, we're becoming more and more attractive. And at some point, we're already working on a immigration system migration and immigration policy, because we have to focus on those who went and want, want, we want them to come back, that will identify in a comprehensive way the gaps that exist, and then we have to define a policy as to how we'll fill that gap. This is a big part of what we're doing in building the future. Educational services. Creating the conditions through which we can attract more international universities, international colleges, medical schools, to be part of the development phase of our country. So in education and health services, we want to be a leader. In climate change, we are a leader. Let me just refer to some stats. So you will understand what I'm saying when I, when I say we are already a leader. 
in climate change. Our forests, our ecosystem, and our biodiversity. It is 18.3 million hectares of standing forests that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon with an estimated, a conservative estimated value of 195 billion United States dollars. That is a conservative value of our standing forces. But we talk about it now. More importantly, this is a forest that stores 4% of all known plant species in the world and more bird species in the entire United States of America, and 3% of all known animal species. That is the biodiversity and ecosystem value of the forest that stands in Ghana. And there are three main challenges the world is going to face. Food security, climate security, and energy security. In, in climate security, we are going to be a leader. Right. Outside of this, outside of this, the deforestation rate of our forests is among the lowest in the world at 0.05%. 0 0.05%. 0 And I'm not counting, well, if we count what the forest receptor is value, you're talking about 500 billion United States dollars. The value of the wood, if you put it in plain language, that we have standing there is 500 billion United States dollars. So on the carbon side, it is 195 billion. And on the standing wood, the trees, is over 500 billion United States dollars. If the world is serious in talking about getting out of fossil fuel and moving in a climate change, zero carbon emission future, let's start playing ball. Let's start here. As I always say, let's not yap. These are the figures. So on climate change, we are standing on solid ground. I can give you the value of our mining sector, but I'm not going to bore you with all of that. We have perhaps, we have perhaps one of the largest reservoir of fresh water. This is going, you're going to see wars in the future about fresh water. We have perhaps the largest reservoir that will support any food system. But we can't catalyze this without the revenues. And let me address the issue, you know. When we ended COP26, people said we must stop fossil fuel. We know that there must be a transition. There has to be a transition. Just three months after the war in Ukraine, we hear from the same people, pump more, but pay your taxes. <laughs> it is based on the subjective conditions. Then, what is the story? We are not going to finance any new entrant, any new entrant in the fossil fuel industry. So they're going to penalize all the new countries who want to get into fossil fuel. Making capital hard to get, making it expensive. What is that going to do? If you're a businessman and the cost of your capital is more, you won't drive up the cost? Who is going to suffer? It is the poor. It's simple. But let's ask them a simple question. Why are you penalizing the new entrants? Are you protecting a monopoly that existed for hundreds of years and people who benefited for hundreds of years from fossil fuel? They won't want to answer that. Because what in fact they're doing 
is creating the conditions under which they are protecting a monopoly of those who have benefited for hundreds of years from the fossil fuel industry. Now we understand our responsibility well, that there needs to be transition. We are now embarking on a gas to shore project. One of the most in inhibitive factors for us as a country in pushing manufacturing, industrial development, agro-processing has always been the cost of energy. For the first time in the history of our country, we have the opportunity to bring down the cost of energy. And by 2025, the cost of energy will be reduced by at least 50% for every single household. Immediately, 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 we are now positioning ourselves to be a leading destination for investment in agro-processing, manufacturing, and industrial development. Infrastructure transformation. And not a, not a major plan of what? Not too long. Tell me, you guys tell me when I should stop. No, <laughs> no, nah, nah, don't tell me keep going. There are a lot of papers here. <laughs> All right, so let me say, let me just give you a little flavor as to what is happening. Right now, we have the new Demerara River Bridge. The contract has been awarded as a four-lane bridge. You see, we cannot develop the country, especially with a small human resource base, in which families or workers that are so limited in number spend four to five hours in the traffic, just going to work and coming home from work. You can't build a country like that. We have to create infrastructure. We have to open up new lands and invest in new farm-to-market access roads. So we're building that new bridge now across the Demra River. At the same time, we have just awarded the contract to a Brazilian company for the first phase of the Linden to Mabura Hill Road. That is a road that links Guyana to Brazil. We have also awarded the contract for all the bridges along that road up to let them to be built into national standard concrete bridges. Wow. What this does for the first time is to catalyze, for the first time, it catalyzes the opportunity of the deep water harbor in Guyana to service northern Brazil. We have just opened expression of interest in a joint Guyana Suriname project that will see the bridging of the Quarantine River, allowing Guyana and Suriname to be integrated with one bridge. We have already awarded and work would have started on the Ogle to Eccles new highway. The Mandela to Eccles new four-lane highway has been completed Eccles the Diamond is now under construction. Uh, Schoonard on the west coast, Crane in the forest phase, then going all the way to Parika, and as we build out, all the way going to Bartika. Opening up the country, opening up opportunities. In September, we'll be signing the new loan to repave the Linden Suicide Highway, improving that entire area. By the way, the new Silica City will go on that highway, leading to resilience and sustainability. We're also looking at a new four-lane highway from New Amsterdam to Molson Creek. And already, already, we have challenges with the Barbies River Bridge because of volumes and opening up that river. So we have to start thinking strategically about a uh, a bridge that would allow free access and use of the Barbies River. These are all things that are necessary to drive infrastructure that are necessary to drive the growth and development that is coming our way. Outside of this, we are spending billions of dollars on community infrastructure, community roads, recreational facilities, community ground, building new stadiums. 
creating new growth hubs, development hubs, all across the country. New industrial and commercial zone. For the first time, we are having major investment back in the dairy industry, in the poultry industry, in the livestock industry. We are moving our production of corn and soya from zero by 2025, I think to 35,000 tons, and then moving to sustainability, self-sufficiency, and export to the Caribbean region. We are positioning ourselves to be the food hub of the Caribbean and one of the leading food producers in the region. By 2025, we've already awarded a contract that will see 100% access to treated water for every single person living on the coast of Guyana. 100%. Moving from 50 plus percent to 100% by 2025. And we have removed VAT on electricity and water. We have no intentions of increasing this because we see water as a fundamental human right and that is a social good that the government must be able to subsidize in a manner and deliver to the people. Our housing program, I don't need to speak about this, our housing program is second to none in the Caribbean and Latin America. Our housing program is second to none. 50,000 new house lots. For the first time, we have given every single incentive you can think about or dream about to realize home ownership. For the first time, we have thousands of young people turning their own keys in semi-gated and gated communities. Government subsidizing, working with the banking sector, getting low-income loans without collaterals, moving the low-income interest rate to just two years by three percentage point downwards when it's going upwards globally. This is what we're doing in an environment that we had to battle COVID, battle four floods. And we've been able to accomplish all of this. In healthcare, the same story is there. In education, we are almost halfway through our commitment of 20,000 scholarships to Guyanese. We have more than 10,000 young people studying online at universities all across the world, completely financed by the government. And we are moving rapidly in ensuring university education becomes free. Whilst all of this is happening, we have to be in a position to train 6,000 people to work in the hospitality sector by 2025. Because the new hotels are going to come on stream and they will need people. Correct. We have just entered an agreement with a Canadian college, a college out of the UK and in Barbados to have this certification and training done. We are investing more than 100 million US dollars in what you would know as the Port Moran Training Institute, making it a national skills training institute that will train all the Guyanese that is needed in the future and give them the skills that is needed in the future. Not only in oil and gas, in the near future, we'll need more than 4,000 specialized welders. We are investing in training all these people and building the capacity. This is real work that is going on, real planning that is going on. And we are building it out to be 2030 ready. So the economy is going to be heavily driven on technology. It's going to be a knowledge-based economy. We just had meetings to launch and launch the first part of an innovation village that will be part of Silicon City. Technology that you have never seen before, cutting edge. We are not moving in a straight line. We are building tomorrow today. That is what we have to do in order to be competitive. And it's not talking it, it's getting it done on the ground. We have been able to negotiate with the UAE. And by September, September, November, November, I have my fact checker in the back there. Okay. <laughs> by November, we're going to launch a program where Every single primary school child 
will be exposed to training in coding before they leave primary school. Nowhere else. And we are introducing in secondary school intermediate training in software development so that our children can be part of the new emerging tech industry that is coming. One company alone has just committed, because of the policies and incentives that we're given, to develop the call center industry to create 5,000 jobs in the next two years. That one company alone. And guess what? They're bringing the big players. And why is this important? Many people say call center is the low level. But let me explain to you what a call center means. We're going to train people, and I don't use this term, but people use it. I don't like it. You say they're housewives at home. The women at home who are not working are not working sometimes because they don't have the opportunity. We are now going to train them to work in those call centers so that the disposable income for the family will increase and improve. When the disposable income is improved, more value is created at the family, family level. More prosperity is created at the family level. When more prosperity is created at the family level, there is greater feeling of inclusiveness. And guess what? The salary they will get from the call center is equivalent to three times what a low income, low repayment will be for a home. That is new money. Additional money coming to the family. These are a type of investment. We're investing in technical education. We are building our tourism product. We have just, for the first time, we have worked, we have worked to get the CPL finals. But it's not only about the cricket. It is creating a new product called Cricket Carnival. It's bringing together two aspects of Caribbean culture. Two aspects of Caribbean culture together that drives traffic. We're working with KLM, British Airways, Virgin, in getting more capacity coming into the country. These are things that we're doing. These are investments that we are making so that life can be better. I'm not going to tell you about what we're doing for the old age pensioners, for the children giving them back, They're because we care, grant, school uniform, grant. For the first time, we have given a grant to every single person living with disability in the country. More importantly, we have now registered every single person living with disability and they will be on the permanent register for public assistance every single month from the government. We are also building a system through which we will help to integrate them in the workforce. We will help to integrate them and create opportunities for their creative minds building out special needs schools across the country, training teachers in special needs education, training volunteers, training home care workers, working on building daycare centers and strategic areas across the country so that young women do not lose their careers when they get children. But that the system, institutions, the government, must be able to develop institutions and infrastructure that help them to achieve both the family and also help them to advance and protect their careers. These sometimes are referred to the soft issues, but they are very hard issues that affect people on a daily basis. These are the investments we are making. These are the things that we are doing to, work, to create comprehensive growth. 
a holistic approach to growth and development. We don't want to create uneven growth. We have to work on ensuring that the system works for every single one. That is why when we are supporting vulnerable communities and vulnerable people, it is not handouts. In every society, there is vulnerability. And the society must be able to take care of the vulnerability that exists. Otherwise, we'll have inequality and disparity that can lead to many social problems. Those who look at this and say it's handout, they don't have a clue what development is. The religious leaders are here, they can tell you in the text it refers to these circumstances. We are building a country that will be driven by a transformative economy, a modern financial architecture, technology, knowledge, research and development that will create resilience and sustainability. We are very humble by what we have. We have to remain a humble people, strong in our values. We have to refocus our, our energy on building families and communities, creating an environment in which we build trust. We take responsibility for each other. We support each other. We celebrate the accomplishment of each other. Not an environment in which there is rancor and there is arrogance and there is hate and there is perpetual push to divide us. I do not care about such an environment. My focus is very simple. It is on all the people of this country. And here in the diaspora sometimes I'm upset. Because people sit from a very comfortable chair or a coffee shop and they will go on social media and say the worst of things. Not wanting to be part of the solution, but find joy and pride in being part of the problem. Yes. Well, I have to. You will not shake me. My belief and commitment in the people of this country is unshakable. So when I come off this stage and I come to you, and social media will reflect the whole different story, all I will do is smile and say, let's move on. Yeah. Let's move on. Because I have recognized already in society, there are some who will move forward. And there are some who would want to pull you backwards. To those who want to pull backwards, I say there is still space for you to move forward. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, we can't wait forever for you to make up your mind what you want to do. So whenever you're ready to join the train, meet us at the next stop. God bless you. Put your hands together one more time. Thank you. I know you want you want him to speak longer. He tried. He gave me everything. Shakespeare is the one who said, "The world is your oyster," but the president was telling you that Guyana is your oyster. Ladies and gentlemen, please. The president is actually on the floor, and the reason why he's there is that he's going to take questions and to interact. Please do not get up from your seats. To, we just want to avoid any kind of confusion. 
We have one person that's going with a mic. If you want to ask a question, just put your hands up, and that person will come up to you. Three questions at a time. When you do ask a question, please don't give a long narrative. Get to the point very, very quickly and ask the question. Thank you. take those personal issues from you. And what they're going to do when they take those issues, they're going to go back home, they're going to look into whatever your problem is. And so we're leaving here on Wednesday. We get home on Thursday. So we get home on Thursday. Five days after Thursday, they will email you back. They will check on your issue and they'll email you what is the position of your issue. So any personal issues, they're taking it, okay? So you have them on both sides of the room and at the back. Okay, let's proceed. Next question. Hi, my name is Colette Boston. Um, my family has property um, in Essequibo. Um, my uncle or our cousin was killed by the police. Um, I don't know what was done. But last I heard, Mr. Quibble was really upset about what was done to uh, Mr. Boston in that area. Um, my question is this. Um, how are you trying to recruit young Guyanese who were brought up over here back to Guyana to build up the country since there has been a little bit of a brain drain from Guyana. Question. Okay, my question is that uh, on the U.S. Embassy, uh, when you go on there, they tell you a lot of things about what um, they're giving to Guyana, they give $4 to $4 million for youth development 
in Guyana. Uh, Mr. Ali, I saw your, your program, I watched you study, and I saw your program of the youth development, but there was uh, not enough of, uh, like, together, half and half of um, young people to be at that opening ceremony. So I just want to know if it's just for one side or it is for everyone. Because it's a good program the U.S. Embassy is doing also. The USAID that gave $44 million for um, the community of um, the Caribbean community and Guyana through the CARICOM. All right, so I don't know about $44 million. Uh, I know that we have many programs in the U.S. But you don't have any 44 million US dollars program again, right? I can assure you that. You maybe have uh, 44 million Ghana dollars in total uh, supporting youth work. And they, they work with youth organizations across the country. Now if you're talking about the President Youth Choice, you, you, uh, sorry, the President Youth Advisory Council, where is Marcia? What What you would want to know is that that youth council has just been celebrated by the UN. It's one of the first youth advisory councils to the president ever established. More importantly, I don't know which one of the programs you are looking at, but the diversity of that youth council is beyond anything you can dream of. And I don't operate by 50-50 or 20-20 or 30-30. I operate by Guyanese, Guyanese being part of the Youth Council. And what I can assure you is that the Youth Council is a representation of all Guyanese, by gender and by ethnicity. Gender and ethnicity. And I'm very proud of the Youth Council. And I can tell you, the Youth Council will be very disappointed to hear them be classified like that. This, this, the Youth Council is really a group of, and I see many young people here who can tell you, because they were there. They were there at the launching. But let's not get carried away uh, with these, you know, sometimes strange narrative that we hear. But maybe I would, I should have, Marcy, do we have any video with you Council? I'm sure I have it on my Facebook. I would like them to look at that video and show me. Uh, oh, and they have a Facebook page too, the Youth Council. Go to that Youth Council Facebook page, the Advisory Council, and then I'll give you my number and you'll call me and tell me how beautiful you feel. Now, young people going back home, I agree. That is what we are doing. We are creating the opportunities for everybody. But when you came here, you were young. You came for opportunities. You came and make the commitment. Nobody came with a tractor or a bus or a plane to get you. The United States created an environment that allowed persons to get opportunity. And you came here and you made use of the opportunity. We are creating an environment back home to give you that opportunity. So just as you got your flight from Ghana to the US, Take your flight from the U.S. to Guyana and come for the opportunity. You see, I mean, let me be very frank with you. I'm a shoot trade. I, I, sh I, I just shoot trade. You know? If you want to beat around the bush, wrong man. If you want to dance around the tongue, wrong man. And I can dance, trust me. We are going to work in a very straight and transparent manner. So, my answers are going to be very precise. Now, on the issue of Mr. Boston, a very unfortunate incident that was raised. But the system is working. I think the police, one police officer has been charged, right? Uh, charged for murder, right? Murder or manslaughter? I, well, don't hold me to it, but I know there are already charges, and that matters before the court. My friend who asked about the about our boys, uh, making me give up my next visit. Because 
in a few weeks, I'll be in all boys town walking there, making decisions with the people. You see, I don't want, I don't want to go and tell the people what is good for them. I'm going to walk on the ground, talk to the people, meet with them, and then they will tell me what their priorities are. And we're going to work with them. Let me tell you one thing that we're doing right now. We have just awarded a contract. You know when you go to Guyana, where they, that's Pleasance, right? The market. Where the Pleasance, Pleasance market is, there's a huge track of reserve. Huh? The penitence. Tell me the wrong thing. The penitence market. There's a huge track of land that goes all the way alongside all boys town. Remember that? Guess what? That track of land is now going to be converted to a four-lane road with a boulevard that will take up the value of properties there by hundreds of percent, changing the entire look of that area and the community. Those are the type of things that is creating transformation within the communities themselves. Yes, let's go. I think I address all those. Next, next question. Good evening, Mr. President. I was home last August, and I want to congratulate, congratulate you with the work that has been done. But one thing that stops me is the banking industry. You need to do some work with the banking industry. That's all. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. Thank you for being here. My name is Loretta Grant, and my question to you is, how do you choose a person who needs heart trans, not transplant, but stent? How, how, do, how does it work? Because my sister was on the list at Georgetown Hospital who suffered a major heart attack. Her pulmonary valve and her tricuspid valve are stenotic. And when she was there yesterday, from being on top of the list, they told her that she had to wait again because somebody else is more important and they're dying. In the meantime, my sister can't even walk up one tread of stairs. So I want to know, how do they choose who should get the surgery from the volunteers that are coming to Guyana? Your Excellency, I have a very difficult name. I hope you're not going to discriminate me for that. Number one, Robin Justin is, Justin is sitting in the Caracas Embassy in Venezuela. Is he qualified to represent Guyanese at political protocol? Is he a conform ambassador? And can you, you mentioned about old age pension. What measures are you taking to control the crossings from Venezuela to Latin? Are you going to build a wall with that road for you to pass it? something. I spoke just now about us being responsible. We are part of a global community. As I speak to you now, we have more than 10% of the size of our population as migrants from Venezuela because of the difficulty they are facing. You should be proud that your country is providing support, food, shelter, and social services so that more than 90,000 migrants Because we have a responsibility. We have a global responsibility and we must take that responsibility seriously. And let me tell you, as the country develops and more opportunities are there, more people will come. That is how development is. We have to build a system to take care of this and to address this. Now I want to clear up uh, a little thing here. In terms of heart surgeries and the heart stenton, so we have the, we have the um, Caribbean Heart Institute. Now there is no volunteer. 
we pay for every single service that is done there. The government subsidizes it 100%. 100%. We had persons in the diaspora who invested in. We have some uh, groups that come every year and they assist. Now I can't tell you who get priority. That's a medical decision. Like any other country in the world, it's a medical decision. You can give our three staff the information from their sister and we can, we can find out about it and let the medical people advise us on why, why and who uh, is at the top of the list. But that much I can help you with, okay? Give them the information, we'll get back to you on that. But we're also building, for the first time, a uh, uh, cardiac hospital. And we're working on this with Mount Sinai. So they are working with us on improving our capacity. The private sector is investing in this also, so our capacity will be improved tremendously. The banking sector, I am with you 100%. But you're sitting in an in a environment that is part of the problem. You see, the Prime Minister of Barbados went before the uh, House and gave evidence two days ago, dealing with the financial system itself. Because the developed world imposes conditions on the developing world that they don't themselves have for their own citizens. You can open a account here in our, but for any person opening an account in a developing country, you have to go through piles of paperwork. This is imposed upon us. And if we don't fill up those paperwork, guess what? They say you're not FATF compliant. And then you suffer with sanctions. This is the reality. But the banking sector, the efficiency in the banking sector needs to improve tremendously. I've spoken about this publicly, but they are faced with this challenge. And we're working now as a region, the whole Caribbean region, working together to remove this challenge. All right? Good. Mr. President, before I get to my question, um, I'm Albert Baldio, the elected district leader of Richmond Hill. Thank you very much for being here, and more so for your wonderful universal message. I'm not, I'm not about building a wall, we are about expanding the wall. How can you expand with us in the diaspora in accordance with your um, universal guideline of one Guyana so we can have a greater exchange of trade and ideas and positivity that you can help us with and show uh, an example for us to come together and unify here because a lot of our resources, a lot of our talents are being wasted by a failure to follow that sort of um, community and unity which you've espoused so successfully in Guyana. If you can help us with that, we'd be very grateful, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. President, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, first and foremost, uh, may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon each and every one of us. Uh, I have three questions actually, and okay, one, I thought it was three questions, okay. Uh, one question, all right. As someone who has grown up in the United States, and I understand you said it's easy, the same way how we came to the United States on an airline, we can go back to Guyana to invest in Guyana. The only problem that we have as the generation that has grown here to go back home is the crime rates and the issues with the crime that's been happening. So it's easy that we can say, you know what, we can go back, but what is the government doing to curb the crime situation in Guyana that can give us an incentive to come back to Guyana and invest? Uh, my friend, where do you live in New, in New York? Where do you live? Uh, no, in Georgia. Okay, check the crime rate in Georgia for me, please. <laughs> That's good. Good check it.
Good evening, Mr. President. And good evening, everyone. Oh, one second. Let us help him. Help him. Check it for capital in Georgia and then. Good evening, Mr. President, once again. I just want to uh, just address something. My name is Sasha Watson, and I'm a business entrepreneur here in the U.S. And we give back to Guyana every year. And, you know, we give um, hundreds of backpacks to children and school supplies. But at the end of the day, when we're giving back those things to our community in Guyana, we, uh, we are charging taxes when we're sending down those things to Guyana for some reason. That's one of my issues. The other thing is I was a young lady growing up on the east coast of Pigeon Island, east coast of Demerara. The poverty level still remains the same. I am just asking you guys if you can really address that issue in the back of Pigeon Island, east coast of Demerara. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I was recently in Pigeon Island. Pigeon Island was a squatting area. The entire Pigeon Island was a squatter settlement. We built infrastructure and we developed Pigeon Island, the front part, into a regularized housing scheme. So when it was a squatter settlement, the value of a land was nil. We built infrastructure the value of a piece of land in Pigeon Island now, you can go to Pigeon Island now and check, it's millions of Guyana dollars. Move from zero to millions. You agree with that? So how can you say that the poverty level remain the same? If you're agreeing with me on that, how can you say the poverty level remain the same? I mean, we, we gotta be rational, not emotional. All I want us to be is rational, not emotional. So if you increase the net value from zero to millions, then the property level has to change. Now, the second part of the of Pigeon Island, there still remains a spot of settlement on the sea defense reserve. You think you can come to the US and build a house on the reserve for the uh, river defense? When we're talking about rules-based society, it must be applied. So what we have said to those persons, who can be regularized, will be regularized. Who cannot be regularized, we have to move them into a structured housing scheme. Now, let me explain to you something else. In 1990, there were over close to 300 squatter settlements in there. As I speak to you now, there is perhaps less than 40 squatter settlements. So, what I'm say saying to you is supported by facts. If you go back to Pigeon Island now, you will see that we are further enhancing infrastructure. That will further take up the value. So poverty has not remained the same in Pigeon Island, my dear. It has changed drastically for the better. Next. Excellency. Next. You got to pick up for me? Okay. Excellency, President Erfanali, I want to congratulate you. May I finish these questions, yeah? All right, go on, go on. I want to congratulate you and the people and the PDP party in Guyana for the fine job that they're doing. These people who are criticizing and make statements, yes, they are free to talk. They are free to talk, but the interest rate in America is 6% presently. People are not talking about that. People are talking about what is happening. Cost of living in America since the Ukraine and Russia problem have gone up by 50 to 60%. And Guyana is a small country and we are making rapid progress every day. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just say this, uh, and I address, where is my brother, man? My brother, Georgia man, George, the man from Georgia. <laughs> I address the issue of crime. I told you all we're doing. I recognize it as a challenge, right? But my brother, let me give you something here, man. In Georgia, 
There is a crime every two minutes and 49 seconds. Hold on, man. I, I give you the facts here. I ain't gaffing. There's a crime every two minutes and 47 seconds. The crime rate per capita, you asked me to check per capita, in Georgia is 55.3. The crime rate in Guyana per capita is 19.9. Oh man, well, you've got to be troubled by This is the fact. This is we just check it. Now let me tell you, let me tell you, my friend. Let me, I just, just, I agree with you. That is why I address it. But I just need to deal with, deal with things factually, right? And not emotionally. Guyana is a small society. You know, I got some friends can tell you all who give him blow to who in Guyana. <laughs> we so small, right? You can't do that in Georgia, right? When you have a small society, problems are amplified because most people are connected to the problem. If somebody loses a sheep in Lenora, the whole Lenora know when a man loses a sheep. <laughs> Because people are connected. This is how small societies operate. So things are amplified. There are some countries in the region who understand how important tourism is for those regions. And you will never see their entire headline or front page of the newspaper. Speaking about every crime. Who if you get picked? Let, let me give you, let me give, I give an example in Orlando. Ramnare Sarwan is my friend. I went to Miami. And we went into the mall and we left the laptop in the vehicle. By the time I came out back, we went to buy ice. Thing gone. <laughs> but I still love Miami. The system has to work. Let the guys tell you, these guys in uniform, you know, I, 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 sometimes you feel sorry for them. They have to face the challenge of crime that is changing in nature every day. And with every single person owning a phone or being a reporter, they are on greater scrutiny every single day in the way they execute their jobs, which is good. It helps in transparency and accountability. But let us not use crime as the excuse of not coming home. I have heard this tirelessly. It is a challenge like any other country. We are working on it. You have many people. All those who went home in the last two years here, put up your hand. Yeah. 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 Keep your hands up, man. All right. And all those who of you here who went home in the last two years and you got robbed, keep your hand up. None. You see that, my friend? Look, right there. I did a poll for you, my brother. My brother, I just did the poll for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Move on, next. His Excellency, I have, I have two businesses in Guyana, and my question is, how are we going to improve our internet? You think? Mr. President, thank you very much for coming to our community. My name is Dr. Baldeo. I've been in the Richmond for 28 years, seeing over 500,000 patients. To address the distinguished panel above is that not only do we need to confine our religious... Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Is that not to only confine ourselves to our churches, our mosques, our temples, etc., in order to impart knowledge. If we can actually be able to tell our congregation that through empathy, through tolerance and patience, one by one we can get through. In one Guyana not only that, but one United States as well. Mr. President, to you, sir, thank you very much for a fabulous, fabulous speech. In addition to outlining what your vision is for Guyana to the future, I hope you're also making ways and means of keeping your position there so that five or ten year period can be done. Thank you, sir.
Baldeo, I thought you would have told them the value of land and what is happening. All right, on the issue of internet, you know one of the great difficulties we had was that there was a monopoly. For the first time, in, what, in the first month in our, was the first month or first six days? Marcia, was it the first month or six days we based, broke the monopoly? In the first 60 days in office, we broke the monopoly. And what we've seen since we broke the monopoly is tremendous investment now in fiber optic. We have three fiber optic cables coming into the country. That is why the call center industry is seeing a more viable future now in Diana. And not only is the quality improving, but also the cost is coming down. And that is what we want. So you're right, it was a problem, recognize the problem, create the policy to solve the problem, and now the investment is, is being made to solve the problem. All right, let's go on. Mr. President, greetings. Thank you for that presentation, a uh, very good address. I know you, my name is Monica Sanchez, and um, I, am, uh, I have a civic organization that empower, promote women, so my concern and question is geared toward gender equality. I know you're here to address the U UN, and um, as you know, education is the focus of this uh, session. My question to you is, as to gender equality in Guyana, programs, programs, counseling, solutions, things of that nature in concern with uh, sexual abuse for young girls. What, if any, do you have in place uh, concerning that? And will you be speaking about that at the UN? Thank you. Um, I didn't come to complain or I got, I'm happy. I just want to compliment. For the time that the PPP government been in power, this is progress. So put your hands up. Thank you, God bless you. <laughs> now listen, I, I didn't address the issue. Uh, the young lady who said that they do, is, they take stuff back to Guyana to distribute, and you pay taxes. Where, where is the young lady? No, no, not this one, earlier, earlier. The one before Pigeon Island. It's the same one. Can I ask you a question? Where is she? She left. Okay, because I wanted to know whether she re registered as an NGO in Guyana. Once you're registered with an N as an NGO, the problem's done. But you have to follow the process. Every Everybody can't just decide you wake up one morning and send it down a barrel. You have to have structure. You have to register as an NGO. And Ms. Sanchez, your questions are so relevant extremely important issues, not only for Guyana, but for the world. So, this issue has been occupying a great part of our agenda. Minister Vindi uh, has been working on this, but more importantly, we are working in the school system. We are building support mechanisms, expanding counseling, building care facilities. Uh, the, the, the Forest Lady launched very recently a project that is called Removing Period Poverty for the first time, giving girls access to uh, sanitary uh, napkins for the entire year, all across the country. These are important things. They, they were taboo subjects in the past, you know this. Educating women, educating men, educating young people, stronger sexual offense laws. It's a whole architecture. I would love to have a conversation with you. And um, at many sidebars at the UN, the, the sub meetings and committee meetings, this issue will be raised. But it's very, very, that and mental health are two issues we are focusing heavily on. I didn't get the opportunity to speak about mental health, 
but those are issues that, and, and you can give Marcia your number so we can contact you and have a great conversation, but very, very critical issue. Thank you. Mr. President, my name is Shazia. I've met you before you have become president. And today, that was when my brother Charles was in hiding, trying to save Guyana. And today, I'm very proud that I'm not disappointed in the good job you have been doing for Guyana. And like my friend here, I want to congratulate you for the wonderful job you have been doing. And I like that trend that you use all of Guyana. And that's a great thing you're doing. But I have one problem. And I went home recently. I just came back. As my brother here was complaining about the security in Guyana, you must please pay attention to the police officers that you have in the country. Because if you're pulled over or you have a crime going on, you just give them some money and they're gone or they, they, they jail the wrong person. And we've had very bad experience with certain people. I probably can contact the other ladies you have there to help and I'll let you know. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming to New York to speak with us. I'd like to thank the Secret Service and law enforcement for protecting you. And may Allah take you home back safely. Uh, recently I was in Guyana and um, a lot of roads have been built. Um, none have pavements both sides. Uh, I was at Cotton Field, staying at a hotel. It was scary to walk to Anna Regina Masjid. I had to take taxi to go there and come back. So that's that's something I think you need to address. Those bicycle lanes are not really wrong. They need two pavement both sides. Um, you know, that's the issue that they have to address. I would like to um, say one of your best appointments is uh, Minister Priya Malik Chan. Excellent job she's doing. And on a lighter note, um, I'd like to thank Barry Jack Dio to go on um, the Adonai show. We, we did that kind of entertainment. <laughs> Please tell me. All right, Jack, do I say thank you very much. Well, anyway, this is Ali Bakshnevi. Hi, uh, good afternoon, President. Uh, the question I have for you is that um, during the election, and I would say rigging, in Guyana in 2020, there was a lot of guardian of democracy. And we have, um, I think uh, you have mentioned it, uh, that we were going to give some awards to these people. Um, what is the status with us and vaccine? Because I know quite a few people who do a wonderful job. They might not have been asked to the PVP or so, but they are actually guarding democracy. And it is my honor wishes to see some of them being recognized. Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Good night, Mr. President. My name is Lady Iru. I'm from New Jersey, but I'm 110% Guyanese, okay? Oh my gosh, I'm walking the wrong Make up yourself, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. President, I've been raising Guyana flag for the past 20 years in New Jersey and keeping Guyana on the map. And I know there's lots of things that when we talk to leaders that they say they would do, but when you do call, the ministry or the people in charge, they're on a different page to you. So I'm asking that the things that you said that you would do for the people, that the people in the office keep on the same track with you. and not saying, well, they can't do this and they can't do that. Because a lot of times we have been promised things that we don't ever get when we leave meetings like this. So I'm just asking that Whenever there's a promise, it should be kept. And I'm saying that for people like us in the diaspora that is doing a lot of stuff for the people back home, right now we're tired and weary of spending our money, so we need some help from the government. Because right now I'm trying to build a special needs home in Agricola because nobody's looking at that. I don't mind, but I'm trying, but I need help. I have a center there, 
I do a lot of stuff for the people in Agricola. And I never lived here. But I would like to get some help in continuing to do the things that I'm doing for special and the underprivileged. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, they just told me that they have a specific time you have to exit here. So, how far are we from the time? So, we have to decide because I know there's a lot of people who I want to take photographs for. So, so listen, listen. Uh, let's go for the democratic rule. How many more questions do you think we should take? No more. No more. No more. No more. All right, all right, all right. Listen. The answer is one and none. I will say three. That's it. Let's take three more. M Mr. President, anyone wants to take picture, just line up on this side here. Okay. No, 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 no. Excuse me. Okay, picture. We Everybody who want to take pictures, please take join the line here. Yeah. So there's no more questions. We're going to take three questions more. Three questions. Is there any more questions? Three questions more, President.